good evening everyone this is uh, tejinder singh i am one of the board members for friends of art for national wildlife refuge we have an excellent session with chuck orty uh, soon but just want to um you know do some housekeeping you know once you join please uh, keep uh, your phones on mute um uh, throughout the session chuck has um, you know indicated he's open to uh, taking questions as you you know if you have a question you can put that question in the chat and we'll get to those questions uh but without further ado i just wanted to introduce chuck chuck otty he is you know like an avid birder he was just telling me he has been birding since he was 4 but he is also a secretary of the cancer ornithological society and then also uh the editor of their newsletter the horn lock that he has been editing since 2015 uh and he has authored a couple of books uh books from uh, birds of kansas so chuck welcome and thank you you know this could not have been a perfect uh, time to have this webinar you know with you know with the biggest week uh, of birding coming up in may and we have quite a few uh, you know people who have joined from here locally uh, we look forward to learning from you and being a better birder well thank you tj i really am excited to be here tonight i'm going to sit here and try to talk and get my screen sharing going at the same time Um I'm to that age we're doing two things at once is always a challenge. Um There we, there we go. Yeah. Now we're up and running. Yeah, um it's it's just I love talking about birds. I I have been a bird watcher since I was 4 years old. My mother was a bird watcher, my grandmother was a bird watcher. I guess you could say I was genetically predisposed. I was bound to be a bird watcher, but um it, it's just it's been part of my life for absolutely forever. I love talking about birds and I've just I've I've had the opportunity to do that quite a bit and nothing makes me happier. So um there we go. Oh, I didn't mean to go that. Well, yeah, that's fine. Let's go ahead and get started. Um we all started as beginners. We all started as beginning birders. Uh some started very young as I did. Others were more advanced in their age. I've got a good friend who start, he and his wife started birding when they retired. So, you know, it can happen all all the time. Uh one of the most important things to remember is we've all goofed on bird IDs. I'm not even going to begin to tell you how many things I have turned meadow larks into, but it's over 2 dozen. So I mean it it happens. So it's it's okay. Making mistakes is a learning opportunity. We've all done it, we will all do it and and just don't be defensive if that idea is corrected. stop and learn from it i've been 15 years as the secretary of our kansas bird records committee and i tell people birding is part hobby part science and every once in a while they have a head on collision so don't get too wrapped up in yourself in your in your identification learn from from your oops i missed that one we all have personal challenges um challenges on on identification Your challenges are going to depend on where you live, depend on the time of the year. It also depends on how involved you want to get in the hobby. Um and and that's the beauty of bird watching. It can be all over the board. You can go all in like Chuck does and and travel to different states and different countries to go birding. You can focus only on the birds in your backyard. You know, during during the pandemic, there were a lot of people that realized that watching the birds in their backyard was something that was a safe to do and be something that could cross generations it was really that got a lot of people in touch with nature so and i tell people i don't care if you call it a cardinal or a red bird i don't care if you call it a goldfinch or wild canary if they bring you joy that's what it's all about and that's what's really neat about it so all in in your backyard everywhere in between Now I've been doing this program for probably 8 or 10 years. And and back the December 2018 issue of Bird Watching magazine came out and Maeve Kim, a, a excellent bird watcher and author from either Vermont or New Hampshire, I can't remember, had a, a a article called Birding ID Curveballs. And I read this article and it's like, wow, she, I mean we're on the trains on the same track here. She really broke things down into distance weather or light movement that bird is always on the move impediments which is a broad category and contortions so those were her id curve balls at the end of my program i'm going to circle back around and tell you what she said about it and we'll kind of go on through and and hit most all those points 
first thing I always tell people, learn the common species well. Know what makes a robin a robin. Know what makes a house sparrow a house sparrow. Down here in the lower right, these three birds on the top of that, that fence have caused more people Hi. more problems because they're, they're nothing more than a female house sparrow. But it's, they just, they throw people, you know. Sit down and say, what makes a robin a robin? Robin redbreast. No, it's not a redbreast. It's orange. It's got a bicolored bill. It's got white undertail. I mean, what makes a robin a robin? Because the more you focus on what makes a common bird what it is, the easier it is to get on beyond that. Now, this is my favorite one. The uncommon presentation of a common species. That is what has gotten me and metal arcs in trouble more than once. This is a gall at a lake in central Kansas in the middle of December. And even though it appears to be headless, you have everything here you need to know to identify it. It's a first winter ring-billed gall. Ring-billed galls are a common gall here in Kansas and across a lot of the country. And just from what you can see there, you've got it. So by studying those common species, you avoid trying to turn that into a mew gall or gosh knows what else. So just study those common birds. Vocalizations. That's one of the beauties about birds. We can see them. We can hear them. If you get close to certain nesting colonies of, say, herons or egrets or get around a vulture nest, you can smell them, too. And it's not pleasant. But to determine bird species and simply to locate birds, vocalizations come in so important. You may not know what that call is but your ears can lead you to those birds. Say, okay, there's a bird singing. I don't know what it is. Let's try to find it. And then you just step by step by step. When, when my wife, who is also a bird watcher, and I go to a new area, one of the things we do is listen for the bird calls we don't know. Oh, that's a white-eyed berry. Oh, that's a summer town. Oh, wait, what's that? I don't know that one. That's where we go. That's how we decide. So understand the vocalizations change across the year and across weather. Bird calls are going to increase with warmer temperatures, sunshine, lower wind speeds. They're going to decrease or at least be harder to hear with lower temperatures, clouds, and windy weather. So which always, if you're in an area like next to a large lake or in Kansas, when you get a lot of wind, it's going to be tricky to hear sometimes. So you've got to just pay a little bit more attention. Now, in Lucas and Ottawa counties in Ohio and Northeast Ohio in general, probably not a lot of Western meadowlarks. I was looking at the eBird charts, and yeah, they're there, but not real common. Where I live here in central Kansas, we're in the twilight zone. We've got them both. And how's the quickest way to tell them apart? By song. Now, these pictures are strategically arranged as if you were looking at a map. If you're looking at a map, north is, on the north is up, south is down. East is on the right, west is on the left. So the eastern metal arc's on the right, the western metal arc's on the left. It's the only way I can figure out how to keep them straight. Identifying metal arcs by sight can be a challenge here in Kansas. Song is very helpful. So vocalizations can be so helpful. If you happen to have some of the older recordings, compact disc, or in my case, even vinyl LPs, um, a lot of it, they didn't have a lot of space. So they focused on the breeding season songs, most distinctive. Well, you get out of the breeding season, a lot of birds aren't going to be using those songs. So that becomes a real challenge. So we need to work on learning the chip notes and other vocalizations. Our Eastern Phoebes showed up the first of last week. It wasn't singing yet, but we heard the, the chip notes from it. Monday, it started singing the full song, so it made it easier. Now, the smartphone apps are wonderful. Space isn't a constraint. So they can have 12 different vocalizations for this bird or that bird. They can have chip notes. They can have flight calls. They have so many. The, the smartphone apps are really, really wonderful. Use them with caution and consideration. Excessive playing of a bird's territorial song during the breeding season can really cause a lot of stress and potential disturbance. So we want to not cause them to abandon nesting. Very important. That it's just consideration, I think, is the most important word there. The other thing is, and, and since I started this program years ago, I've had to add this one, be cautious with the Merlin Bird ID app. It is really amazing. It's accurate about 
95 to 97% of the time. Just always follow up what Merlin is saying with you hearing the bird call or you seeing the bird. I'll be pishing, you know, ch -ch -ch, trying to get birds up and my wife will be running Merlin. And we always have a running joke about what kind of world species did it come up with this time? Because it, it always tries to identify me, but use it, follow up those IDs with your own vision or your own hearing so that you can say, yeah, I specifically heard this. It wasn't a case of Merlin heard it. I'm 68. I've got older male hearing loss, unfortunately. My wife still has amazing radar hearing. So there are times that she will hear a song, Merlin will hear a song, and I won't. So I'm not going to count the bird until I can hear it or I can see it. Know where the birds are. That's so important. Um, bird the weather. Is it windy or calm? Is it cold or hot? Is it sunny? Is it cloudy? Different kinds of weather conditions are going to dictate where the birds will be. So you've got to kind of take that into account. If it's windy and cold, they're going to be trying to find some place in the sun, if that's possible, out of the wind, and where there is food. Following the food can be such a big, important thing. Know what these species eat. In the wintertime, you're obviously going to have, you know, fruit eaters or seed eaters, something like that. So it makes it a little bit easier. Learn those habitats. Breeding species especially have very specific needs and wants. The wild card in everything is migration. Expect the unexpected in migration. Several falls ago, several Octobers ago, um, we had a, a unusual very end of the month snowstorm. Big front moved through and we had a snowstorm across Kansas. And it managed to happen right while woodcocks were migrating. Woodcock migration is something we don't normally notice around here, not in the fall anyway. We had woodcock records from over 40 counties. About a fourth of those were where they had never been reported before. And they were in people's backyards. They were in the drive through of a Taco Bell. Just craziest things ever. And we did a paper on it and got all sorts of new records. But when migration is happening, anything may turn up anywhere. That's just a fact of life. So learn where the birds are or might be. Uh, know your limits. Limits of you and your equipment. Um, distances are a challenge. Um, I live next to Milford Lake. Milford Lake is the largest body of water in Kansas. It's all of a whopping 16,000 surface acres. Nothing compared to Lake Erie. But the same challenges. There's places where those birds are going to be that the closest you can get to them is a mile away. So you're out there on a nice November morning. You see some specks out there, you put your 60 power scope on them, and there is so much heat coming off the water, even though it's only 40 degrees, that all you see are wavy lines and a speck. Then let's add wind into that, and then your scope is vibrating. You're going to run into the same problems there at Lake Area at the refuge. So sometimes just accept the fact that not every bird is going to be identifiable. Don't guess at it. Don't make something up. Just walk away from it. It's okay to say there's a duck out there. It's too far away to know exactly what it is. I know a lot of birders who have problems with, are, are just, you know, like, ah, if I can't ID every single bird, it's okay. Just walk away. If you're e birding it, put it down as a duck. Okay, now here's where we get to have a little bit of fun. What's our biggest impediment? to correct bird identification? What's our, what, what is the single biggest challenge that we have to overcome to correctly identify that bird? Don't freak out here. It's our eyes, plain and simple. Our eyes are our biggest challenge. Okay, that's enough of my eye up close. Most of us can see literally millions of hues and tints of color. It's just mind boggling. Now think about it, how many times have you tried to identify not just a bird, but anything, and your description starts with the color. It was a yellow bird, it was a red bird, it was this, that, or the other. And the problem is then we immediately start jumping to different conclusions. 
look for patterns. Does it have wing bars? Does it have eye rings? Does it have a pattern on the head? Where, where are the colors? Birders love warblers, specifically male warblers in spring. They're brilliant. They're colorful. They have amazing songs. But a lot of those same birders despise sparrows, shorebirds, gulls, because these are generally monochromatic species. They're things that are browns and grays, not a lot of bright colors on them. So they're challenged by them. You've got to look for the subtle patterns. Eyes are, I mean, we're, we're visually oriented species as humans. Color overwhelms everything, including sound. We get into where we're seeing a lot of color and a lot of movement, a lot of things, that, and our eyes, ears just kind of start to wind down. Eyes are selfish. They want all the attention. Get out someplace in migration in the morning where there's a lot of bird activity, a lot of bird song. And then sit down, grab a camp chair or something, sit down for five minutes, close your eyes and listen. You will hear so much more. It's just amazing. Don't look at, don't look at Merlin. Just try to identify what all you can hear and just all the different calls. It is just so much fun. For the non-birding public, the beginning birders, just recognize the fact that color is what they're going to see first. Well, it was a solid red bird. Okay. Well, it could have been a cardinal. Could have been a summer tanager. Could have been a scarlet tanager. What was the beak like? And they just kind of look at you like, I don't know. Well, that would be a big hint. So the other thing is everyone sees color differently. And the processes that go through when we're printing, printing field guides, a very well used ver version of Sibley here, um, when they're printing that, it's not always perfect. And even what we see on our computer screens can be skewed a little bit. So don't try to match colors. My wife is a quilter. And if you want to hear an entertaining argument, listen to us discussing what shade a certain fabric is or a paint chip or something. It's just Amy knows my wife and she's sitting there laughing at me right now. Um, and it's just everyone is going to see color differently. Nobody's right. Nobody's wrong. It's just how we see things. So learn to see the entire bird. Bird. Um, avoid what I like to call single field mark paralysis. Somebody will describe a bird perfectly, except for this one thing. And they're saying, but this one thing isn't right. Okay, let's go with the majority of the field marks that you saw. So do that holistic bird identification. See the entire bird. Then use everything else. How does it look? Where is it? What's the setting, the habitat? How is it behaving? What is it eating? Or is it with other birds? What is it socializing with? Is it vocalizing? And I'll get back to some of these here in a little bit. Beaks, beaks, beaks. I just can't say enough about beaks. Um, they're, they're such a clue because they're so important in a bird's life. Warblers and vireos, they both have these tiny little insect eating beaks, but they're different. Vireos have that little hook on the end of it. So use every clue that you have available. Use checklists. Use eBird bar charts. Just songs. Everything. Again, a caveat there, migration's a wild card. You never know what's going to show up in migration. But be prepared. Can you ID in black and white? Otherwise, if you, if you took away, if somebody just gives you a black and white picture, can you identify it? which is always a challenge. 1934, Roger Torrey Peterson, get the book down here where you can see it, came out with this birds, uh, the field guide to the birds. Groundbreaking. First time that a guide had been really printed, meant not for having a dead bird in your hand, which was common at the time, but identifying a, a live bird in the, in the trees, in the shrub, on the lawn. Most of the plates were in black and white, just like this right here. And yet, with what's here on these plates and what was written, you have everything you need to know to identify each and every one of those species, black and white. That's the challenge sometimes. Um, our eyes use, going to have a little bit of biology here, our eyes use different parts of the retina to see color in black and white. We have rods and we have cones. Unless you're an owl, then all you have are rods. But rods see black and white. 
cones see the color. The cones need a lot higher light intensity to, to really differentiate the color, which is why owls have sacrificed color vision for black and white. They can pack a lot more sensors in there and they can see so well in dim light. Recognize that under limited light, colors grow dim and colors become light and dark shades of gray. If you've ever been out before dawn and, and managed to stay awake through dawn and see how all those shades of gray start to take on color and things like that. There's a song that um, by the Moody Blues, Nights in White Satin, we probably all have heard it before. And if you hear the long version of it at the very end, there's a, there's a spoken piece. And it's talking about how as the sun sets and the moon comes out, it changes things. I'm just gonna read three lines out of this poem. Cold hearted orb that rules the night removes the colors from our sight. Red is gray and yellow white. And that is exactly what happens. Also be aware that as the sun comes up and then goes down, it changes the, the, the spectrum so that early morning, late evening, you can see all sorts of blue or orange hues. I've got a photographer friend who's done several of the pictures in my presentation that talks about the sweet light in the evening, those, those orange colorations. You get a bird early in the morning flying across water, white parts will look blue because of the light that's reflecting off the water. So just be aware of that late morning, early evening, and it, it affects photography as well. So all of a sudden things can look really funny on your camera. Ah, uh, the eternal conundrum, purple finch or house finch. Had this picture sent in from a friend, Dave Hoffman. And he said, Chuck, I don't know what it is. And I was just playing around with it. I went from, I said, well, I think I know what it is. And then for some reason, I changed it to black and white. And all of a sudden I went, wow, look at that. You know, you're, you're sitting here looking at these colors and going, well, is that more this, that, or the other? And what we miss is, there's really an eye line there or an eye stripe. I won't use the word supercilium because that sounds uppity, but, but right through here. And if you think about the female purple finch, it has this big, bold, white supercilium, this eye stripe. And we don't think of that with the males, but when you convert the color to black and white, it just jumps out at me. Then you start noticing, okay, it's got very diffuse markings down here. My quilting birding wife that I mentioned earlier, I, I was all excited this the evening that I discovered this. I said, Jake, come here, come here, take a look at this. And she just kind of looked at me and she went, yeah. And what quilters will do is if they're looking at a quilt, and they're trying to figure out the pattern, they'll get distracted by the color. So they'll take a picture of it and then do it in black and white. And then they can see the pattern a whole lot easier. It's like, well, I guess I'm late to the party here, but, you know, it's just, it's a great, if you have a picture, convert to black and white. See how it changes things. Try to determine the sex and age of the bird that you're looking at. Some species have sexual dimorphism. American goldfinches, northern cardinals, the males, the females look differently. Then we have blue jays and robins, a lot of other species that they look the same to us. So see if you can figure out, is it a male or a female? A lot of times people, I'll be on Facebook and people be pop up a picture and go, I just can't figure out what this is. Well, it's a common bird, but it's a female. And they're looking at the male pictures in the online or wherever. Then we get the immature versus juvenile versus juvenile versus multi-year development. I, I don't worry about all that juvenile. Ju I just, it's either immature or adult plumage. Recognize that, you know, the bald eagle has a four-year cycle before it gets its full white head and tail. Herring gull will up, take up to five years to get the full adult plumage. So recognize that it may take a few years to get there. Basic versus alternate plumage. That's fancy words for saying basic is winter plumage, alternate is breeding plumage. But realize that some species change a lot from one to the other. Now, in all of these field guides, like I was just holding up my Sibley here, that's very well used. Before you get to the pictures of the birds, there's a whole, all this front matter that has a wealth of information. I was probably 30, 35 years old before I actually sat down and started reading that information. And it was like, wow, why did I read this years before? 
because it explains so much. And a lot of the stuff that I'm going through tonight is in there. So take the time to read that stuff. Perceptions of size and shape. An individual bird on a yard, on a lake, on a branch in a tree is very challenging because it's hard to know shape and size. I would get, as Secretary of the Records Committee, get reports of birds and they would say, the bird was six and a half inches long. Okay, they copied that right out of the bird book. There's no way that unless they had the dead bird in their hand that they could measure it and say it was six and a half inches long. If you can, reference it to something known when it's with other birds. It was about the same size as a robin, but it just wasn't as chunky as a robin. Yeah, do things like that. It's hard to judge distance. It's hard to judge size. Even the color of a bird can skew your perception of its size. I've done programs for people I'll have just round, just circles. One's black, one's white. They're the same size. I'll hold them up and I'll say, okay, which one's bigger? And they'll always say the dark one is bigger because it just, it gives them the perception of that. So be cautious of that. Be very cautious. Going further beyond the color, how does the bird fly? Flight is so diagnostic. Woodpeckers have just a very specific flight style. Crows skipped school the day that they were taught how to glide because they are just always flapping their wings. They, they just, they don't know how to glide where ravens do. So flight can be very, you know, a crow and a, and a pillated woodpecker can look fairly similar, but their flight is so different. So different. Silhouettes. What is the silhouette of the bird? You and I both know what happens. You're trying to look at this bird and it gets itself right between you and the sun. And then all you see, it, yeah, color is gone. All you see is shape. What does it look like as the light goes down? I love the fact that a, the bright red cardinal who's coming to my bird feeder right at sundown suddenly looks gray. It's like, is that a male or a female? We, we learn probably plumage characteristics first. But what else do you know about the birds? Habitat, feeding habits, food preferences, things like cardinals and have, have this, this massive seed cracking bill, which tells us a lot. Yet they get into the breeding season and they're grabbing caterpillars everywhere they can because they need that high protein for their growing young. So that can tell you a lot about what that bird might be. Here's one of my favorites. Phoebes and peewees, Eastern Phoebe, Eastern Wood Peewee. Similar sized birds, looks too darn close to, similar to each other. Both insect eaters, flycatcher family. Our Phoebes are back already here in, in North, Northeast Kansas, North Central Kansas. Peewees aren't gonna show up until the 1st of May. They're still six weeks away. Why? They're both insect eaters. Now I could leave you hanging on that and make you go and look for it, but Phoebes are, are browsers. They will go, they'll look behind the, the, in the cracks of bark for overwintering insects. Phoebes are aerial flight specialists. They're catching insects on the, on the fly. Migrants, where do they go in the winter? A lot of our Phoebes, and Ohio's going to be the same, they go south to the coast. They're not neotropic migrants. Peewees are. If we have a really warm spell like we've had right now, second warmest February on record here in Kansas, um, Phoebes are going to know that and they're going to start heading back north maybe a little bit early. Peewees are down in Central or South America. I was going to look that up and I forgot. Um, but all they've got to go by is the amount of day length. When the amount of day length gets to a certain point, they will start migrating. Phoebes are going to be more influenced by the weather. Again, use every clue you have available to it's birds are a giant treasure hunt where we can figure out so much about them, so much about them, all about birds on Cornell's website has just so much wonderful information that can just go beyond the bird books. Photography. I have been accused of being anti photographer. That is not true. I just think people sometimes, well, let me get into this. Cameras are a very valuable tool in bird watching. The digital photography explosion of the last 20 years has literally just exploded our knowledge of birds and our collective library bird photos. Historically, we have 
collected birds, meaning we went out and shot them, or collected birds that died from other means, and then they'd be prepared as museum mounds. And we would look at them. You can see great details in the plumage and size and like that. But what this digital photography explosion has done is allow us to see how do those feathers, how does that wing, how does that tail react when it's in flight, when it's making that big sweeping turn under power? How are those feathers, those primary flight feathers, distorting? And why does that change things? It's just, it's taken us to another level of bird understanding. Bird collecting still has a place, but bird photography of today has given us so much more information. Documentation of rarities. 15 years ago, I would say that 25% of the records that were submitted as rarities here in Kansas had photos. Now it's 75%. It's just that much of a change. Photographs have limitations. I always remind people, a bird is a three-dimensional, living, moving organism. A photo is a two-dimensional, maybe as, as quick as one four thousandth of a second capture in time. So there's, there's a lot of differences there. Cameras can, I mean, they can stop action. And they are incredibly sharp, but they have a different role than our eyes do. Our eyes see things differently, breadth and depth of vision. Let's think about it this way. If you and I are sitting here and we start moving our hands back to our sides, not quite 180 degree, but a lot of us probably have 160 to 170 degree breadth of vision, field of view. We pick up our binoculars and all of a sudden that comes down to this. You know, maybe six, seven, eight degrees. Then we pick up the camera and we go from this down to this. Just a very small area, especially with a high zoom or telephoto lens. You're really, you're looking at one very small area of the world around us. The best wildlife photographers I know are amazing birders. They know their birds. They know what they're looking for. I see a lot of people get very obsessed with trying to get a shot of the bird, seeing as much of the bird as they can, that they're oblivious of what else is going on. People will send me pictures all the time. Don't mind looking at it. And I'll start asking them questions. Well, how is it behaving? How is it acting? Was it vocalizing? And all of a sudden they were going, um, I don't know, because they were so, it's those selfish eyes again. They were focused on the bird. Here's a case in point, as I try to correct my posture. Um, got a good friend 20 miles away, retired professor of biology at Kansas State University. Uh, Dave is a, loves raptors. He's a wonderful raptor photographer. Probably about 10 years ago, red-shouldered hawks were really just getting moving into our area and further on west in Kansas. It's another story. And he knew that he was probably going to be able to get this red-shouldered hawk at this location for the first time ever on their Christmas bird count. And he came around the corner. There it was. He jumps out. He whips up the camera. He gets this shot. And I'm zoomed in a little bit here. But enough to see, you know, yeah, we've got the, the black and we've got the banding on the tail. We've got the stuff in there. It's, it's a red-shouldered hawk, plain and simple. He got home that night from the compilation. And he's looking at the picture and putting his, and all of a sudden he realizes at the bottom of the picture, there's another bird. There is another bird there. A snipe flushed at the same time that the red-shouldered hawk took out. Dave never saw it. Until he went back and looked at it. He was so focused on this. Hit the right key, it helps, Chuck. That he didn't see this, even though it was in the viewfinder. So even looking in the viewfinder, looking at the back of the, he he missed it completely. And it would have been, and they would not have had snipe on the on the count that year if he wouldn't have seen that. So it it, it just it happens. Okay. A few more thoughts on photography. What do you, if if you are a photographer, and there's and I encourage people to do it. I I don't take a lot of pictures, but I take some. What do you do with your photographs afterwards? Do you ID them and file them for your photographed life list? Does image underscore 5863 get changed to yellow rumped warbler Eastern race? Take the time to sit down and study them. Look at all the features. 
feather by feather. Look at the plumage. Look at the non-feathered parts of the bird. Birds like gulls and shorebirds like, oh my gosh, how are we ever going to tell those apart? You start spending a lot of time looking at them and you, you just see all these amazing little things that you might have been missing otherwise. The spots on the primary feathers, this, that, or the other. The hard parts, the beaks, the feet, the I call them toenails, unless they're on raptors and I call them talons. The skin around the eyes, painted bunting. TJ and Amy and I were talking about painted buntings here earlier. And the adult male painted bunting has this just phenomenal blue head. And a little bit of skin around the eye is red. It's just amazing. Look at all the bird. Here we go. Female red-winged blackbird. Absolutely nothing spectacular about it, except it trips up a lot of people in, in identification. But with a photo like this, you can start looking at how sharp that beak is and how it would come up over the head. And it's just, it's a straight line. The, the toenails are just amazing on a lot of these birds. And that's what I've really started noticing on a lot of the digital photography of, of small pastoring species, sparrows, bobolinks, things like that. It just, you quickly understand how they can hang on to things like they do sometimes. And you can start to look at the individual primaries and the secondaries. And it just, it's amazing to look at them. Absolutely amazing to look at them. But then I say, don't get so caught up in the bird. I'm telling you to look at the entire bird to identify it. You don't want to miss the details. That's my thumb. And that is a hummingbird body feather on there. I don't know if it's a breast feather or a back feather. Um, my wife and I were with friends on the Blue Ridge Parkway of North Carolina, and we were at a little hotel. In the morning, we were out on the breakfast area, and there was a hummingbird feeder sitting there. And my wife said, is there any nectar in that feeder? And I got up and went over and looked. I said, no, there isn't. But on the back side, there was this feather. And look how tiny that feather is in comparison to my thumb. And I brought it around, and everybody looked at it. And I said, quick, take a picture of it. And she did. And about three seconds later, gust of wind took it and blew it away. But because she got that picture, I've got that amazing detail. I mean, hummingbirds are amazing anyway, but then to see that detail in a feather like that and how small those feathers are, but it's just, it was just a special moment. Okay, let's get back to Maeve Kim's article, Birding ID Curveballs. Next two slides are going to talk about the things that she suggested to get past those pitfalls, get past those traps from getting tripped up. Know what common birds look like. What makes a sparrow a sparrow? What makes a robin a robin? What makes a cardinal a cardinal? And not a periloxia. Learn bird behavior. Why do birds do what they do? I do a lot of programs and I tell people, when you're studying birds, you've got to realize that through the course of a year, a lot of what birds do comes down to two things. Food and the need to reproduce. So it comes down to food and sex, plain and simple. So that's the driving force. Bird the habitat. Know what your habitat is. Find your, your what do I want to call it, your, your, your patch. Bird your patch. Four years ago, my wife and I moved out north of, of the town where I'd, we'd lived for 35 years, out to the farm in the old farmhouse where she grew up. 100-year-old farmhouse that has its challenges. But on the back of the house, we've developed a brick patio and we've got our chairs out there, and that is our happy place. And we sit out there, even on mornings when it's a little bit cool, like this time of year, put our coats on and go out there and we just listen. And it's just, the more you are birding in a place, day after day after day, the more things you will find and the more things you'll become familiar with. Bird with locals. Oh, I just can't emphasize that enough. I've been doing bird walks for about 30 years from spring through fall. And we, yeah, it's a socialization event, but we just have so much fun. And you get synergy. You get two birders together and they will see more than one birder alone. So it's just, it's, it's so much fun. It's just so much fun. Take kids with you when you go birding. Oh, I just can't emphasize that enough either. I, I, like I said, I've been doing these walks for 30 years. And I was about to the point I'm retired Man, do I want to keep doing this? Oh, it's only nine months out of the year. And then last spring, we had two families start showing up that have, have youngsters from, let's say, six to 13 years of age. And these kids were good. 
they're really good and they take notes they draw um they're just they and they reinvigorated me it just has made it so much fun again going across the dam of the lake here and i saw long-tailed three long-tailed ducks the other day and i i sent them a text and they're homeschool kids and they were right over and i was able to get them in the scope on the long-tailed ducks and they were just so excited to do that so it just makes it fun bird not with just with your eyes bird with your ears listen for those cue notes listen for those little things that go wait a minute you know around here just this week the the junko started doing that trill call not quite as melodious as a pine warbler slower drier looser than a chipping sparrow but it was just like oh yeah another three weeks those guys are going to be gone but until then we've got that taking notes is a lost art form take copious notes because you can go back i tell people the bird may only be in front of you for 30 seconds spend as much time as you can watching the bird don't do the thing of look at the bird for three seconds then get your field guide or get your phone app start looking at the app trying to match it up watch the bird as long as you can if it's there for more than 30 seconds pull out a notepad and start taking notes the first time i saw these kids last spring with notepads i was like oh my gosh i thought it was a lost art so it was so exciting talk aloud to yourself and what this amounts to is you're going to start working through the bird do it with birds you know but do it also with birds you don't know okay what kind of beak does it have what's the head pattern what's the leg and just start doing it because talking aloud to yourself forces you to slow down so you're not rushing through and, and trying to get from point a to point g without going through b c d e f slow down sketch i'm a horrible artist oh you wouldn't believe how bad i am but sometimes you just got to sketch make little notes beside it going okay this was this this was this this was this and then mave also says try birding with your camera you know use it to don't use it in place of your binoculars use it in addition to your binoculars um it's just see what you can take pictures of and then, then her last cue is go birding a lot and i'll talk come back to this in just a second but it's the more you're out there the more you're going to see the more you're going to learn when it's nighttime and you're inside and it's no good basketball games on it's not baseball season yet pick up the field guide and start going through it page by page i did that for years for my generation we had no internet we didn't have phone apps we had a book we had about three bird books and that was it so i would just spend hours going through those and literally memorizing them so do your study my closing thoughts oh good i try to make my talks about 45 minutes birding is just amazing it's a wonderful way to explore the world and when you're out there and i'm on my bird walks you know if it's a slow july saturday and we're birding We'll talk about the wildflowers. We'll talk about the grasshoppers, the dragonflies. It's just the natural world is around you. And that is just so amazing. Birds are literally everywhere. I don't care if you're in downtown Chicago or out in the middle of, of you know, the, the desert. There are birds around. May not be a lot of them, but there's birds around. Birding is a time of fellowship. It's a great time. We have so much fun with these walks. Thank you. Thank you to Facebook and, and social media and everything else. Beware the internet expert. It is easy to sit here behind your keyboard and just type all sorts of things on Facebook, on email, on whatever. And sometimes they get a little bit ugly with some of those comments. There's a lot of people that think they know it all. And they're going to be the first to tell you so. Hang out with those experienced locals. They're going to be working with you and helping you through people post pictures of birds on our kansas birding facebook page they say what is this and i try to get in there and say okay look at the finches section you know pay attention to this i'm trying to walk them through the discovery process and somebody jumps in and says that's a great crown rosie finch which believe it or not we just had the second record in wichita kansas two days ago it's just like whoa gal was a photographer she got great pictures it'll be wonderful but hang with those locals you will learn so much from them and they will walk you through about why is it a b weeks wren and not a carolina wren those things that'll help you along there are no shortcuts if you ever saw the movie or any one of the movies the matrix um wonderful science fiction you know you can't plug in and just immediately download all the instructions for running a huey helicopter it just doesn't work that way 
It takes studying, it takes practice and an experience. If you are fairly new to birding, get an eBird account. Even if you're just birding your backyard, the citizen science and the database that is being developed from that is just phenomenal, just absolutely phenomenal. And, and the more information that comes in, the better. Plus it checks you. If you're putting in something off the wall, one of, one of the moderators will, hey, you may want to think about this. I probably isn't this species, so it, it's helpful. Blaze your own trail. Uh, one of the things that I'm noticing in the past few years is why what I call the eBird hotspot phenomenon. Rather than learning how to look for good habitat and how to go someplace, people go, okay, I want to see a painted bunning. They're seen on Walla Walla Road in May, so I'm going to go there and I'm going to see one. Yeah, it's not that easy. And it may have been a vagrant that was there once and then gone. Now, in the case of Walla Walla Road in May, there will be painted buddings there every year. But anyway, um, so just learn to just go off by yourself. Do I use eBird hotspots? Oh, yeah. And I look at birding trails and get information. And then I go through there and I don't worry about a specific location rather than just bird the habitat. And finally, ABB, always be birding. I have a pouch soft-sided briefcase that goes with me everywhere. My life is in it. My, it's my purse, I'll be honest. Um, and there's always binoculars in it. There are, I am never without my binoculars. And it's just, if I am, I feel like I'm without my phone nowadays. It's just like, oh, I'm naked. I gotta have it. I gotta have it. So always be birding, be listening, be looking. And I spent 40 years as an extension agent working with farmers and homeowners and producers. And it wasn't too long that I'd been here and farmers soon figured out that I was always birding. And we'd be out next to a tree line looking at a, at a soybean field. And all of a sudden, I'd be listening to the farmer talk and I'd be gazing over here trying to figure out where that bird is calling from. They got used to it. They figured out, oh, that's just Chuck. Don't worry about it. So always be birding. And with that, I'm to questions. I'm going to pass that to that. So fire away. Open it up. I'll leave this up for about a, two minutes and then I'll stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you, just Chuck, for doing this excellent presentation. You know, no questions in the chat yet. Okay. Uh, but we'll let you know. Maybe if somebody has a question, you know, we, they can unmute themselves and ask uh, as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I will stop sharing this. Okay. Amy knows for my, knows my phone number and my email address. If anybody needs to get in touch with me, <laughs> questions from y'all. And thank you for joining joining me tonight. I I am a member of the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge Friends Group. I have been to the refuge a couple of times. Uh, love getting back. When I get back to Ohio, I it's always like we're going to go to North, Northwest Ohio. We're going to go up to Ottawa, and hopefully I'll get to see Amy and some good birds. And I, unless somebody has a question, you know, maybe I have a question. Okay. So as a beginner, beginner birder or maybe an advanced birder, what type of binoculars you prefer? You know, the 8 by 42 or the 8, 10 by 42 you know? Either one of those or something in between. Um, I'm out here in the Great Plains. I'm out over here at the lake regularly. I need all the magnification I can get. So I usually have 10 by 42s. Okay. Um, if, I, you know, if I was east of the Mississippi River, I would probably have a pair of 8 by 42s. Uh, it's just, it's, they, they give you a little bit more. The changes are just enough different there. But either one works fine. I'm back in North Carolina birding with my 10 by 42s. I don't have any trouble. Um, okay. I, I think it's important. I tell people when they were talking about binoculars, there's a lot of good binoculars out there. Buy the best ones that you can, that you can afford. Um, but the other thing is, don't just take everybody's opinion. Binoculars are like shoes. you got to try them on. You got to try them on. Go to a sporting goods store where they've got a good selection, and just start looking at them, see which ones feel comfortable to you. But I, you. I like both eight by forty twos and ten by forty twos. I want to ask Paul in that picture there. He's holding up a pine cone. What kind of pine cone is that? <laughs> Paul. He may have to unmute himself here. Yeah. It's a big pine cone. It looks like a sugar pine from out in... Yeah, no, it's not sugar pine. I'm not sure. Oh, he, he, says he doesn't, oh, he know. doesn't know. Okay. Yeah. It's a nice pine cone. <laughs> Thank you for responding, Paul. Appreciate that. Other questions? Now, what I will tell you is, you know, my assistance to y'all, 
doesn't end when we all sign off tonight. Um, my email's there. Um, if you've got questions, email them to me. If you got a picture of a bird and you're not sure, email it to me. Oh, we, that's awesome. We appreciate that. Yeah, yeah I just, I, I love to help birders. I mean, uh, the birding community is so helpful. I've helped a lot of birders. Other birders have helped me. That's what life is all about. I mean, oh. we are a, a, human beings are a social species. Even introverts like me need other human beings around. Um, so I've just, I love to help. I love yeah. to help. No, you're right. And then see, going birding with locals, you know, that's, we have a local birding group here. I Good. think a couple of uh, members. So what I learned the most was when I went out with them on birding walks than just going by myself. I enjoyed photographing them when I was alone, but I learned more when I was out birding with them. And I know somebody has a question. I think uh, Marsha has a hand raised or somebody has a hand raised. Let me see. You got a question, unmute and ask. Yeah. Or maybe that was an accidental hand raise. Oh, yeah, but Paul says pine cone was at uh, Pinnacles National Park, Park where yeah. I saw California condors. So yeah, it's 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 not sugar pine. Sugar pine would be longer, but that's getting into some of the other sides of my life. Yeah. Could have been a digger pine. I don't know. Uh, Raja Kanal has a question. Uh, Orka Kanai. Um, hi yeah. everyone. Like nice talk. It's really yeah. nice to listen to this one. Uh, I'm from Ottawa, Canada. It's okay. Uh, nice Welcome, to join yeah. uh, this group. Yeah. Um, I'm really new to uh, birder. Like, uh, like, is there any like couple of things that uh, where where should I start? Uh, basically, do you, do you have any do you have any bird books? Any field guides? I I, I have a national ge like geography one. Like that's the, that's the one I bought it. Yeah. Okay. And then I have a bin binocular uh, like eight by forty uh, two. Okay. You're, you got the first two steps out of the way, and, and the National Geographic, Sibley, the Coffin Field Guides. I mean, those three are the, are the top of my list always. Go someplace, you know, find a park, find a nature center, and just birds are most active in the morning, the first four to five hours after sunrise. Just go there at first thing in the morning and start walking around. And, and you may not know a lot of the birds, but just break it down, you know, one at a time. Don't try to worry. I'm going to identify all these bird calls. I, no, don't worry about that. Say, okay, here's a bird call. I'm going to track it down. Oh, that might be a blue jay. So just one step at a time. Take notes. Start keeping a list. Lists, I think, are very important to help you learn. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Good question. Everybody's shy when we get on these Zoom things, except me. <laughs> I don't Anything know if, else? Yeah. Anything else? If not, people are probably oh, wondering yeah. why I am a member of, living in Kansas, why I'm a member of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge Friends. And it's all because of Amy. <laughs> Got to know Amy. Well, what? I think the reason I know anything about Kansas birds is all because of you. So it's a reciprocal <laughs> agreement. <laughs> No, I, I got probably to probably know, know I lived in Kansas for a few years. Um, my husband was in the Army at Fort Riley, and Chuck was the first bird nature person I met when I get out there. So he's been a great asset, great, great friend. Capital uh, F and little f. So Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Good to be here. Somebody just asked a question. question. A, yes, Marsha had a question. Yep. Memorizing bird songs? Yes. Okay. You know... <sighs> A lot of, because we are so visually oriented, it's easier for us to remember what a picture looks like. But yet, songs will come on the radio and we'll sing right along with that song. Why? Because we've heard it forever. R rote memory, repetition is how we learn. And, and before the, uh, the apps, the smartphone apps, and I use the Sibley app a lot, um, which I get points for that but i don't um we would sit there and and just quiz each other okay what's this one what's this one especially as we're heading into spring here and warbler's songs are coming up we'd sit there and quiz each other on warbler calls it's like oh man i know that one i know that one i know that one oh that's right that's black and white warbler so it's just it just takes time to listen and listen and listen i think that the merlin bird id app where you can take it out with you and then sit there and kind of look at it. And when a bird calls, it'll light up on it. Um, that is helpful. 
we were looking for a sparrow now and I just lost it. Bachman Sparrow. I think we were in North Carolina and we knew we were in the right place. Pulled the app out and pretty soon it's like, wait a minute, it's lighting up. Okay. Okay. There it is. There, there's, and so it helped us find it. And then we weren't expecting Prairie Warbler and that started lighting up. We found Prairie Warbler. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that the Merlin Bird ID app can be a good learning tool and it also will record the song so you can go back and play it over again and listen to that call. But it's just, it's practice, practice. You got to hear the, just like on the radio, you got to hear that song a thousand times and then you'll be able to remember it. See any other questions so far? You know, I don't want to hold you up also, Chuck. Yeah, I just have one question. The sandbar behind you, you know, is that also? in kansas or uh, no that is not in kansas yeah, okay. sandbar behind me is from north carolina i don't remember which beach we were at we've got good friends in north carolina and once or twice a year we'll go and spend a couple of weeks on the on the shore with them that was in october several years ago and it was just at a great place that as the as the tide would start to go out gulls and terns and skimmers and shorebirds would just start flocking onto these sandbars and i just would say, I mean, I would literally be there for two or three hours with my scope on them and my camera just watching them and taking pictures. It was wonderful. Yeah, right oh, over, let's see, yeah. right over this shoulder, there's a couple of royal turns in close there, yeah. um, which are not a Kansas bird. We've got one record in Kansas. So, <laughs> Any other questions? What was your spark bird, Chuck? What, got what you was started? my spark bird? Oh, excellent question. There are there are three of them, um, probably more than that. My my first one was a bobolink oh, wow. that I, I identified a alternate plumage bobolink when I was six years old. It was on the clothesline of the farm in Nebraska where I grew up, and I knew what it was. My mom did it because of this book that she got me. Um, the after that indigo bunting when I was fourteen, um, I. I road i mean in nebraska where i was uh, not a lot of streams but i rode up to the creek and i heard this beautiful song and i found it um okay four birds hmm. we were going out to see my sister in oregon and we stopped at a rest area in idaho and we heard this beautiful song and tracked it down and it was a lazulite bunting and then the the one that just clinched it forever and ever was the painted bunting mm -hmm. so the, the bunnings have always gotten me <laughs> That's a great bird to have, you know. Yeah, spot and I also grew up 45 miles from the Platte River in Nebraska, 45 miles from Grand Grand Island, Nebraska. And my mom, being a birder, we'd go over there every year in the spring and watch the big sandhill crane migration, which oh. is going on right now. That's just, it's a special time. So. We have one more else, question come up. Yeah. Yeah, something, I saw something about Merlin ID. And then how do birds communicate? Lee Faber has a question. Okay, I, I'm not fast. Uh, yeah, not so she has a, uh, yeah, ahead, he has a question. Yeah, it, how do birds communicate? Birds communicate, I mean, they, they've got their, their territorial songs, their breeding songs. Um, I, I love cardinals because they have so many vocalizations. And if you've got a pair that are nesting close to your house and just sit out in the evening and during the day, you can listen to them talk to their young and just, so, I mean, there, there's that. There are also alarm calls. If you're watching birds at your feeder and uh, some threat comes in, one bird will give an alarm call mm -hmm. and they will all react to it simultaneously. And it appears that the alarm call is specific for either a ground-based threat like a cat or an aerial-based threat like a, like a hawk. Because aerial-based threat, man, they go into cover wherever they can find it. If it's a cat, they just go straight up. Mm -hmm. They don't worry about getting into heavy cover. They just go up to get above the cat's level. So, I mean, it, it's just, it's, that's how they communicate. The, the migratory part of it is what I find most fascinating. Um, a lot of birds, especially things like shorebirds, they don't migrate as family groups like cranes do. Um, adult males leave the breeding grounds first. Then the adult females leave the breeding grounds, and the last ones to leave are the are the young of the year, the immatures, and yet they all wind up at the same location. Um, it's hardwired in. They they think that they're that bird now that birds have receptors that they can see lines of of grab lines of um magnetic lines going through. It just it blows my mind. 
birds have different kind of receptors in their eyes. So it's uh, inbred into them. And sometimes the wiring goes awry, and that's why we have vagrant birds that show up where they shouldn't. What's going on with the limpkins? I don't know. I think you had the limpkins in Ohio the past couple of years, too. We yeah, had Ottawa had, yeah, yeah. We had, uh, two at Ottawa also, yeah. Yeah, uh, we, we'd had no limpkin records in Kansas, and in 2022, they showed up. 2023, we had some more, and we're now up to 21 records of limpkins in Kansas. And Amy, we had one down at the Geary State Fishing Lake this past year. Hmm. So it's just crazy. And then there's the flamingos. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I never thought that my first lifer flamingo would be in the pra tall grass prairies of Kansas at a state fishing lake. And yet that's where it was. Oh. Mm -hmm. Of course, it showed up. At the time that it showed up, I was on the West Coast in Oregon. So I'd ha I had to pray every day that it was going to stick around until I got home. And it did. <laughs> Other questions? Sorry. Start telling bird stories. I'll be here all night. Oh, yeah. oh, we'd love to hear them, yeah. But I think we don't have any other questions. It's right at 8 o'clock. Thank you, Chuck, again, you know. Hopefully we meet when you are here again, you know. Uh, I'll look make it forward a point. To you. Yes, yeah. All right, thank you. Excellent presentation. You know, we'll be sending out the recording uh, in a couple of days. Uh, but uh, really enjoyed it, you know, took some notes. <laughs> I, will def I took a note of your email ID as well. So I'll be There in you go. Yes, yeah. Very good. Thank you. So yeah. TJ, good to meet you. Amy, good to see you again. Good Take care. Thank you so much. Thanks yeah. so much.